Yeah, and I've been fortunate to have worked with WellPlus Enterprises as Tata's, Bharti, Airtel, HCL, NIT, and of course a few gold partners of Microsoft and AI Metaverse. I have a journey of three startups behind me, so you know I also come from the fraternity. They were in media and tech, travel, hospitality, and third one FMCG. I can't say that I had. I've been super successful just because I'm a mentor. But yes, three of them did. Two of them did fairly well, and one of course did fare so well, but it was brought in a lot of learning. So that's more about me. And this hour-long session now, of course, we have 55 minutes to us. I'll go through the uh, complete scenario and how what we want to take it with you. And the end, I will give ample time, say around 20-25 minutes for Q&A and suggestions and engagement. So let's say I'll try to close it by 7-10 and after that we can open to connect. Moving on. See, the thing is that today's dynamic business landscape, scaling is just not about growth. No, it's about transforming a startup into legacy. Now, the thing is that we all, it becomes a very common misnomer like scaling and people just talk about it in a random sense, but actually there's a lot of effort that goes behind it. I'm sure many of you are, you know, startup founders yourself or into the state of seeding an idea or into the ideation stage. So in a way, your journey has already begun. Now, the thing is that where do you take that ideation forward and then turn into, you know, a very successful enterprise, basically. Scaling basically refers to the process of, you know, rapidly growing and expanding the business which in terms of revenue, customer base, and of course, operational radius, which will include both the geography expansion, you know, the headcount, which is the employee count, the product range or diversification. We'll come to certain, ex uh, you know, examples also. And, uh, but at the same time, I'll say this is a disclaimer I would like to share here that, you know, the dynamism and the fluidity of your ecosystem, the data keeps changing. So what are examples I'm referring to? I've been trying to be taken at the most as the most recent phase, but there can be a slight variations here and there, but we'll go along with it just for the sake of references. Um, quickly about scalability. So you know, startups scale in order to reach a larger market and increase profitability without which you cannot survive and establish dominance in the market. We all have been you know, observing the things around us. Uh, 10 years back, one or two, maybe 12 years back, you would say the scale of your time era, 12 to 15 years back, one or two organizations who's come up, it was largely in the international sector. So we would not know there are any journeys like Amazon or, you know, Google and all. We only came to know when they founded themselves in a strong founding, became very strong, dominant players. But the same scenario is not there anymore. Last four years, we have approximately 10,000 plus startups coming into the country in India itself. Some of our startups have already gone into unicorn stage also. So you can see that now we are shoulder to shoulder with the international scenario. Adding on to this, the IPR flavor, you know, since I also from the legal and patent uh, scenarios, a huge number of patents, something like 20,000 patents have been filed from the Indian diaspora, you know, right from the Indian geography uh, to both the Indian uh, IP controller office as well as international uh, word uh, offices also. So this speaks a lot about, you know, how we are scaling up and how we are entering to the market. Now this uh, scaling, of course, can be both organic and inorganic uh, for your organization you know, before they reach a unicorn status. And of course, unicorn is just not revenue, you know, as most of you would be knowing, this is more about valuation. So I might be having a little more, uh, less, uh, say around 30 million as my revenue. But I will be valued at 1 billion or 2 billion, basically. That's because the ideation or the product or the expertise or the skill set or whatever I bring to the table as an offering, it might be a service as well. And stands as a lot of potential and promising to the venture capitalists, to the engine investors, or to the industry as such. And thus, I get that status of it. But as you may be knowing, you know, I've, uh, I'll not completely go into the details because there is a small event that we're going to have uh, take place after this. Uh, uh, there are certain organizations which go beyond unicorn, you know, and there are terms for that basically. So uh, I'll quickly move on to that event and then I will come back to this definition. To break the ice, you know, to make the session more meaningful and not just a monologue uh, where I just keep on, you know, like a parroting out. Let's play a very short quiz. Um, uh, Sumesh will help me in the questions there and we'll, uh, what I will request you is to just mark your answers in the chat window and we will compile all the, you know, Fastest fingers first, kind of say, like KBC. So you can start. We can start from that. Yeah. So this is the reason I was not, you know, spelling out uh, the beyond that. So what is Hacktocon in the startup ecosystem? Uh, people do talk about a lot of uh, unicorns and bootstrapped entities. It's interesting to know what is a Hacktocon, which has a valuation of above uh, 100 billion. 
you know but again i reiterate this uh, reiterate this is a 100 billion valuation and not your revenue or ebitda glad at least you are participating okay since we are from the ecosystem let's just see how much we know our country and our own system so we have got a national startup day many would not know that you know government at least has some focus on startups also now by this organized the ministry of commerce and industry so what is the day with we and celebrate it annually good rohan and mayank also i both of you are correct I must say Rohan has got a fastest fingers. <laughs> yes, this is January 16th. So now many would come to know that you know the government actually has a focus and celebrating one day particularly as a national startup day for the country. Which three unicorns are considered largest in valuation in India? Uh, yes, the answers may vary here and there, but largely whatever you say, we can say spell it out there. And as I said, the dynamism of this ecosystem is so fast that by the time we decide about something. it may change in the market so we do, don't fret about it just go on with whatever you know yeah so we have got sanjay uh, quite close uh, good sanjay of course but dream 11 is not we have got byju's as per my data it's byju's twiggy and oyo which have the, currently the largest ones this is as per october 2023 of course within a month things do change definitely good to see the participation and you know, please keep it up Coming to the last one, uh, Mr. Chief, please ask me, please. Yeah, this is slightly textual, but uh, what is an MAP in a startup ecosystem? And this is very essential for all of you who are at least coming from you know from a product perspective to the well, you see, great, you took it the first one. Yes, this is a minimal viable ecosystem. I mean, we're sorry, minimal viable product uh, in the ecosystem, uh, which is a basic. Uh, Yes, name. I would agree to that also. That's a basic version of the product, you know. Uh, beyond, besides, without pitch, you just cannot forge your uh, story. What you want to bring to the table, at least. Thanks. So this was just a quick, you know, just to you know, to may may make it more engaging. Yeah, I'll just quickly recap the answers here. So Mish can yes, please. Thank you. So Hacktocon is basically a private setup. That's a word, private. You know. Otherwise, organization can just list themselves, release an IPO, and raise a valuation. So, as per the data, only three are currently the hackathons globally, mind you. One is SpaceX from the uh, Musk's table. Other is ByteDance, which is the parent uh, company for TikTok, and third is Shane. So, ByteDance and Shane both are from China, and Space Musk, uh, SpaceX, as we know, is from Musk's table. These are the only three. You know, start with imagine. Uh, ByteDance is just a No, a video sharing platform uh, under TikTok. They also have got some four or five other products also through apps. But TikTok is the one which took the pie, and ByteDance was valued at uh, more than hundred billion. So uh, that's the dynamism in the industry. They, they have no exact product except an engaging platform, and yet they have got a reached a hacked account status. January sixteenth, as you say rightly, Baidu is twenty two billion. Swiggy is at ten point seven billion and OU is at nine billion. That's the three largest unicorns in the country. And of course, MVP is a minimum viable product, a new version, a version of a new product with just enough features to satisfy the early adopters and you know, provide valuable feedback for future development. And uh, we might touch the early adopter segment, you know, which is a Rogers product invention and innovation uh, curve study, which uh, you know, which is very essential to most of the startups. We do not realize that, but at which stage we launch a product, that comes to that. Yeah. So as you were talking about scaling, you know, uh, besides the founder's own vision, the VCs and angel investors also play a key role. You know, for example, there are something known as tier one VCs. You know, which do not limit themselves only to funding. For example, Sequoia or Excel, they're primarily into funding. Like that, but we have got tier one as TTS Vision Group (TVG). They are basically tier one because they do not just fund, but they also try to you know, stand with you, guide you, mentor you at every stage because they have got they are now a stakeholder into your game. So uh, it all depends upon a startup uh, where they want to get aligned to. They just want to look at. They are quite confident of their own strategy and vision, so they just want to go for a pure play VC or you know a, a standalone but strong founded angel investor from the country or international market, or they would like to go for a tier one VC so that they can be guided to a more of global journey, starting from the domestic. Founding, yeah. So this is the startup's journey from concept to success. We have touched uh, till uh, you know unicorns is there or because that's a very very common term. Now decons are coming in. In fact, Flipkart, Baidu's, Nike, and Swiggy are touching the uh, decon status, which is ten billion dollar and above. 
I didn't take it out there, but they are basically reaching there. So this data is getting very fun. This is from Invest India, which is a government portal on you know, maintaining the uh, records and strategies of the startups only. And that's, of course, HackTokon you have seen. So since we have not touched anything in India, I did keep it here. But I hope, and we all hope together that you know, soon we will be able to have a HackTokon coming from India as well. Uh, this is just a glimpse. So, you know, top 50 unicorn, you would see that these are just unicorns. So mind you, they were all uh, decons and otherwise, well, top valuations. They were all touching, you know, decons, but these are both of unicorns which are just entered. For example, you see Zepto, that's a beauty, you know. They started as a Kirana store, failed in Kirana store. 2021 March, they closed the shop of Kirana store, revamped by, I think, by August 2021, five months after, you know, closed, you know they again came back. And Zepto entered into a very competitive market. They were already like Blinkit, Crawfers, which renamed Blinkit. Then they have got other retailers into cost delivery. They have got Instamart from Swiggy. And yet they were able to you know, get that kind of valuation through a positioning, through a proposition. So that matters. So we'll see how things go. You know, there's just a glimpse for you to have a quick view of. And I'm sure many of you will be there on this name list very soon. And will be proud to say that, you know, we have taken a session with you. We will ask us, you know, including you. So scalability, I've already touched, you know, how uh, get they it understand. It's both about business uh, founder's vision. It's about uh, who you take as a stakeholder in a journey. It can be angel investors. It can be your own bootstrap funding. You know, it can be your uh, uh, vision plus uh, your past experiences. But idea is that you should understand how to scale. There are a lot of startups you would realize, I have known personally, who started six years back. At end date, they are just hovering around the same figure of revenue which they had reached a plateau of let's say around four years back. You know, I'm starting zero to four and then five to eight today now. They lag, what are essential tenets of scalability? They didn't touch that. When, when they found that they could raise certain amount of revenue on their own and they have reached a particular level, they were quite satisfied and they got complacent. So again, it's all about a journey of an individual, whether you want to be comfortable at one particular plateau, that was your dream. Or you really want to take it further because your dream lies beyond that. This, this is one of the uh, most pivotal or uh, most more key tenet uh, for any startup, any enterprise as such, any entity which grows. It can be a startup. Of course, it takes on an IPO route later on and all that. And first thing is that define your identity, who you are. You know, we should know first ourselves and then we try to sell something because then that's where the, the integrity and the transparency of founder gets reflected in your offering and that happens. And what is the offering that you are doing? It's a product, it's a service. What is it exactly? You know, And who is the target audience? Because if you do not carve out these three things on the pen and, with the pen and paper on the table, just before you start an ideation and try to, try to jump into the market, you will face a lot of issues because first and foremost is the bedrock foundation. Till the time you're not very clear, you know, you will have a challenge. So for, so for the former stop is not the idea, but to know for whom you are creating your product or service. Unless we are delusional, because eventually all products have a target market, okay? you want to reach uh, the target market that might be through a marketing campaign, that through a you know buzz. Uh, but till the time you have an effective strategy in place, you cannot reach a large market. So whatever you're selling, it has to be, a, a, has a specific set of people, which is a niche market. How do we go about it? Let's have a quick look. Orient it out what I have for the key tenets, and then you have got to understand your own product features which are the obvious and latent, okay? And communicate the idea to, uh, one is first is, I understand your own product's features. Till the time I'm not very confident what I'm selling, you know, or what I'm proposing or what I'm launching or inventing. I will never be able to spell out, you know, its merits, its demerits, its uh, further scope and people. I would not even like to, I would not even realize what I can I do to complement it better, you know? How do I build upon it? How do can I do take an organic growth? How can I acquire other competition to add on to my own product? So first and foremost is understand your own products. What is obvious? What is latent? And then communicate. Idea is to catch people in the decision making process. Your consumers are there, you know, and they are waiting for a product. You would see a lot of examples are there. A product came in, it failed. Multiple product came into the segment, and, and there's an eighth product which came in. So people thought that they would not have a right. Facing it's a too crowded shelf that this person is entering to. And this eight person suddenly turned around the table. So that's because that eighth entity was very clear in what the definitive was. Okay. 
because they understood your product's features, they understood your niche market. What does your product or service satisfy? Does it solve any pain points or problems in your customer's life? That is important because that's how you spell customer success, which comes to the later part of it. Anyhow, if you place yourself as a customer to any product or service or a consumption, you will see that unless an LTD particular product is giving the merit of an experience, which is a very positive experience, a very easy, hassle-free experience and a fantastic value in consumption. Till then, unless it is that all is happening, you are not very loyal to the product brand. Any slight variation in price, any slight variation in any feature and jump onto the competition or the alternatives. Right? But the moment you feel that everything has been met in a very stringent manner, particularly to you, you will stay on that. So that is the kind of segment, but to have that kind of loyalty with the customer base, you need to understand what is the customer looking for and how do I address his pain point or his need? So what are the benefits of purchasing a product or service? Okay. And you can also study your competition. Look at the competition. If there's a competition, already you're competing in the market, study what he's serving. Who is he serving? What are his marketing campaigns like? Whom is he addressing? What are the demographics they're playing? What are the segmentation tactics they're in? Who is their ideal customer? Do I need to address the same customer? Or can I make a difference? Can I go to uh, another segment which my competition has missed out? That gives me, you know, a golden egg, uh, a side entry, as a lateral entry to the market. And, and the last one, of course, is the data, which is the gold nugget. Uh, while we all do this, we have got up number of uh, entities which can give us research reports if we can invest. Or we have got data, we can do some market research on our own. Uh, I've known small, small uh, hospitality organizations as we're launching some resort chains, you know, come like Trippy Feet and others. Uh, they have done a market survey of their own using buzz references, referral links and all that. They could not, they didn't employ professional agencies because of course funds and finances are always a challenge in initial stages. But they did well. So they reached out to something like 2,000, 3,000 people survey, identified a strategy. This is Trippy Feet, uploaded that. And of course, now they have got seven resorts in the north and I think three, four in south as well which is a good start for 11, the 11 properties for a very small entity. Because just because they're very clear how they want to research, they identified the six segments, what are the gaps uh, which competition is not uh, you know, covering, and then they would take it forward. Now, one key essence uh, here is, uh, you know, for example, uh, same way goes for uh, one example of how to identify niche segment is farmery. You know, the farm to fridge or farm to table uh, milk, milk paneer. When they launched 2005, when Mr. Aroda was a founder there, you know, it was a very nascent segment because people were more used to having your milk coming in from the local uh, vendors or uh, Mother Dairy booths or something like that, especially in NCR. What he identified was there was no fresh milk coming from. Only thing is before launching, uh, 2015 to 2018, till the time he has one angel, uh, one angel investor on board, he kept on looking at how to redefine his uh, offering. You know, despite that there was not much competition, that was a passion he had that he kept on redefining, you know, what is his processes and offering. So he worked on his retail apps, which is a distributor apps. He worked on his client apps, the online platform, the logistics completely. You know, he brought in a couple of partners or ex-colleagues who were also from logistics segment. So that is strengthened the entire logistics setup. And today it has the largest, and that type of country, country delight, white farms, bincers started coming in by 2017. Late 17, 18, they started coming up. The market started getting into competition. But you would see that, you know, he understood not the not just the requirement of the customer. He backed it up with very, very strong elements. Logistics, super logistics, uh, la latency-free app so that the customer does not struggle with an app. And so what, usually what happens is we try one or twice with something and then we give up. And eventually because of this, only many of them vanished out. You see White Farms, Benzer, uh, so many of them. You know, they just uh, went on the market. Country Delight was struggling that point of time with the app. I've seen those examples. Today, lately, they have got, they strengthened their product. They have diversified their offering. But it took them, you know, so nine years or maybe around eight, nine years to get where Palmery was there and still there is. It is still has NCR's largest, maybe 6,000 liters of milk production across. So that is the basically an idea of how a technology or tech, uh, tech and uh, vision builds upon this. Now, another element that comes uh, in the short of time, I'll interest. I'll just quickly move on. Uh, I one very very key tenet which I will emphasize upon all uh, startup founders and mentors is understand when to pivot and when to persevere. Okay, so persevere is when we continue with the same line, right? 
But pivot is where we understand that something is, something is not going right. So let's turn around. Uh, this may not, or you uh, just realize that, you know, what you're adapting right now, either it's your own realization, back to study of the market, I have developed a product A, uh, this is serving a particular need of, say, the Northeast, that is good. But I know that the socio-political movement changes in Northeast may curve my product within eight months. And then what? Do I close down my startup? So what I need today is, with a foresight, I need to pivot. I need to, uh, pivoting means I introduced a, a new product or I can understand this product's features and diversify them or I can change the market or I can tweak the product and then bring it to the, for example, the same example I was taking for Zepto, uh, their uh, positioning or USP was not uh, fastest delivery instantly. They were more of Kirana Mart based out of COVID experience, the two Stanford guys, they were looking at how to uh, bring your uh, grocery to from your local uh, tailor a local retailer or grocery store to you when they realize that you know this may not completely work effectively and then with, despite the funding that is the beauty that they had received the funding of 60 million and that they failed uh, you know didn't keep it around or they redefined they pivoted how to change the model then they moved to mini clouds and cloud warehouse put on the usp of 10 million delivery and large very large categories of product offerings and that too especially late evening delivery 7 a.m to up to 1 a.m uh, so they extended the timeline also this they, they brought in this usp and proposition to beat the competition and today it's a trade a unicorn valuation you see that's a success story so this is about pivoting you know and that stands for all basically how we go about it uh, i'll give you an example there was one startup i was consulting they were into apiary products uh, into the fmcg market which is a very very crowded shelf because apiary products of honey and all that now if you see, go to any uh, hypermarket store you see empty number of bottles are kept there you're confused what to take what not to take this particular organization went beyond that you know they tried to get into honey meat uh, basically uh, alcoholic fermented based out of honey because there was a very very uh, what do you call that? A complete blank space in that segment. There was only one company earlier, uh, organization Moonshine, which was into honey meat. So this company tried to identify that honey based thing, honey based medicines, honey based palms. You know, they tried to diversify that into that. So they tried to pivot. You know, uh, uh, while they were entering the field, they then and there itself they identified that this would not <clears throat> give them the kind of scale they are looking at. So do they quit? move into some other product line altogether, or here itself, they like really relook what they are doing. And they do that, did that. They relooked at what they were doing and pivoted. So that's the essence of, you know, pivoting when you are at it. It's all about relooking how you want to you know, persuade a new investor, look at your product, redesign your processes. Don't just get in, madly in love with your product. You know, sometimes that happens with startup founders. They get so fixated and in love with their idea that they want to continue persevering against the wisdom, against the market dynamics, against you know, uh, what are the trends and the real-time happenings there. So that one has to be very particular about. That's a caveat. Okay. Of course, a passion because it's your own baby, but do not fall blindly in love with it. Else you will lose the baby itself. Uh, yes, Sumesh. Uh, yes, Sumesh. Oh, oh, what, uh, next one, please. Next one, please. Yes. Further, yeah. Customer success into revenue, which is essential for everyone. Yes. Next slide, please. Yes, thanks. So as we were talking about, you know, customer base, which is the, the base which brings the bread and butter or the scale to a enterprise, to a startup, you know, your uh, journey is not complete till the time you're clear on how to, you know, uh, look at your customer base because customer success only is to translate to revenue as we just touched upon it. Unless a startup has a pre-decided singular entity that's its client, which is a captive, mono client you know which can be a vc a sponsor or enterprise or even a patent assignee for example if you're coming to the tech patent or a normal patent and you have got one assignee who takes the licenses he might be your client in that time you can just need to please or be engaged with one but if you're going beyond then we cannot do away the benevolent beast called customer its eventual success or undoing is hugely influenced by ability to penetrate market <clears throat> and create customer base and a large customer base with repeat repeat purchase pattern or consumption is the one which drives your EBITDA and PAT. Okay. But then, uh, can we get a large customer base quickly like others have done? No, it's no magic. There is uh, certain science, certain art, you know, it comes with a mixed uh, methodology of its own. It comes gradually. But idea is how to 
design your own processes. Many of you have come out from a corporate ecosystem. Many of you are freshers with a passionate idea. To, but at the same time, when you go about doing and delivering a product or service to the market, you need to know how to define, you know, how to enable the customer success or an idea. So I just took up the example of Parmeri. You know, there is also an example of uh, Amazon, which is an all-time favorite of everybody. If you see, this started off uh, as a book, uh, a seller, okay, a large uh, format book uh, organization. They just started off with that. Then they gradually wrapped up and miniaturized that particular segment into Kindle and you know, ebook segment and mo and pivoted. So they started looking at how to go into e-tailer mode on an online way. But did they just end up with that? No. What the best part was they completely kept on looking at all their moments of truth. How to make a customer very satisfied? How to make a customer leave the platform with a success story so that they it would make the customer want to come back again to them only for all the sales. So we were surprised that despite that Walmart is the largest e uh, retailer in the world, Amazon, which is not a you know brick and mortar uh, retailer, still has the second share in the world in terms of retail. Of course, e-commerce wise, valuation wise, it is the highest, but in terms of retailing, it is still the second most. Why? Because that is the biggest grocery you can say in terms of how they've created their processes. Well, Walmart, Walmart has not scaled up to that level despite its valuation because just because of physical footprint. <clears throat> Amazon has captivated both, both on the online side as well as the, uh, you know, the grocery segment, the cross category, basically. Their online app, both uh, platforms are so strong. Their service policy, no questions asked, easy return policy, especially for Indian diaspora, where we have not used to such kind of a treatment where I want to return something, you know. And a mental assurance that if I have taken an input somewhere, you know, my request will be well uh, preserved, my request will be well uh, considered, and then action will be taken on that. That kind of a mental assurance, you know, uh, that gives you glued onto a platform. And that's where Amazon built its, you know, completely loyal base. Okay. And uh, gradually they have started increasing the range of product and categories. And then on top of that, they have smartened. They sell their own SEO program to their own uh, onboarded uh, vendors. Where then you can you know, uh, pay certain uh, express fees and your <clears throat> uh, onboarding licensing registration. And they try to push you up into the uh, first rankings. Because usually it's a seven second rule of search or human nature that within seven seconds you tend to move to the next page and after that you won't move so first two pages or first seven seconds whatever clicks you is the purchase transform translated into revenue and because of this uh, amazon is today at 1000 1337 billion capitalization of us dollar and alibaba which is second is just 207 approximately six times the difference in addition to that, uh, you need to you know, back up your customer focus with the right modules. So, for example, taking again an example from Amazon, you will have that you have got a CSAT, uh, you have they've, they've woven all this. So, you speak to a customer service agent, he will ask you to close the call, uh, you know, post call, fill in a one line survey. You know, uh, if you have taken a product, they will ask you for a delivery experience. They will ask you to review the product itself. So, at all moments of truth, we have created those, you know elements of taking the customer uh, feedback, which is more product, so they can write the, I, many times it's not so, it has to be absolutely right so that it reflects, you know, and you play around with the SEO and SMM built out content only. Sometimes taking in a professional content writer helps because they know how to you know, place the keywords in the content, how to ensure that your name reflects and jumps every 17 times in a particular page ranking. And that's a game most of SMM and SEO strategies play. The, the reason sometimes content right have so much of focus, you know, when it talks about blogs and SEOs and SMM. So just where you feel that you have got a lacking, acknowledge that and take a professional help. But don't go overboard thinking that you can do it all and then tomorrow, you know, the results may not come to you the way it is. Further to that, once you have built a basic image, go about marketing. Now, it all depends how your funds are. Uh, it can be, you know, how bootstrapped, uh, if you're bootstrapped, how comfortable are you or you've got an angel investor on board, you will have to keep, you know, uh, uh, their confidence in line. They have to be in consent to your thoughts and ideologies or the programs and proposals also. So you, if you have got good funds or bases, you can start for ATL activity, which is basically above the line, which has mass market campaigns, you know, largely like uh, billboards, television ads, you know, uh, major events and all that. 
Uh, for example, Swiggy, Zomato, newspaper publications, large full page ads and all that. Those are all ATL activities. If you have got the fund for it, you can go for it. If you have got, even if you're bootstrapped, but look at how much you can place your, you know, there's a ad mix that we all do. Basically, you can do your fund vis-a-vis uh, -vis an ad mix strategy and see how much you can allocate to fund. What is the campaign duration you want to run, whether it's, you know, two weeks, two months, uh, we are targeting a launch in eight months. So before that, you want to build it up once your POC is done. And what stage do you start it? Whether you want to, but at least have a POC coming in. That's what I would suggest. Uh, sorry, I missed this point earlier. That unless you let you have got a proof of concept built, you know, don't start too early. Because then you will might fall flat. I understand the competition is so tense. People try to start up early so that by the time the product comes out, they already have a visibility. If you are very sure of your product, if you know it's very, very unique, there is no competition, go ahead with that. But if you have got a successful POC, the product is yet to go into a commercial launch, you can confidently start your uh, communication and brand image building and all that. Okay. The other thing you could touch about is PTL, which is below the line, which is targeting individuals, you know, like uh, email marketing, which is considered by Sir, uh, McKinsey and Survey that it's 40 times more effective than social media. And this might include your welcome emails, special occasion emails, abandoned cart, you know, where you have not completed a closed and they reach out to you to close that conversion, the engagement bills, etc. And specific event sponsorships. For example, many events you see CIA awards or FIFA awards. You see the brand is sponsored by certain set. You know, uh, Bombay, uh, this uh, Bombay shaving cream is there or, you know, the, the, the grooming product range. Uh, Billboards, all those basically. Uh, some brand like Mintra, you know, they basically launch some apparel shows are there, then they, or the mage fashion shows are there. They will play place their, their product placement is there. This is all BTL. So again, this depends upon how much budget we have carry and how much so we, each founder knows their own strength on funds basically and where you want to invest. Okay, and of course, uh, the third one, which is a uh, TTL, uh, which is a mix of both ATL and BTL, which is through the line marketing. This is more of strategic marketing where it's a 360 degree. You not only create a larger presence through large media, you also look at uh, small events. One very classic example is Red Bull. Red Bull, uh, if you have, many would have seen the video, Felix Baumgartner, who is basically known as you know, the man without fears, who took a jump from the stratosphere, edge of space, right? <laughs> So it's called status job and Red Bull sponsored that. And besides creating a lot of halabo about it, it also used social media to promote the event, engage with customers in a pinpointed manner. And it was a very effective strategy. The sales increased. People associated Red Bull with, you know, uh, courage and conviction and larger than life happenings. And so imagine just one event, they were very clear about what to sponsor, how to get into that group. And that gave them a result multiplied in many fold. Only thing is, TTL has uh, ATL may take time, uh, but it has got a larger visibility. And BTL and TTL have got more of instant feedback and you know uh, coverages. And TTL has an average uh, cost. BTL is more effective cost. It's quantifiable. ATL is a very high cost. So this is more of a metric. And the last piece of it, uh, in the interest of time, we have got already reached I think seven twenty. So I'm sorry, I have just jumped down the time. Uh, the last stage is once you've created a product, you have uh, taken it to a particular scale. Uh, in your domestic market, what next? Are you satisfied? Would you less like to acquire, you know, and, and organically uh, build upon something within that same domestic market or would like to expand? If you see international startups, they always have this hunger to expand globally. They do not get, uh, except for one or two percent of examples, most of them are basically who look at a larger pie in the global share. And now it's happening in the uh, what do you call that, reverse order also. There a lot of Indian startups have started doing the same. So you have to scale your infrastructure, sharpen back, do that. And then you've got, see, you have got Baijus, which has now reached into Middle East, UK, South Africa. Ola is already into India, Australia, New Zealand. Okay. They have also diversified to food delivery when they acquired Food Panda. Okay. And then Oyo has reached 17 countries. It has already uh, invested in the US by purchasing Hooters Casino. Then again, in Amsterdam, they acquired Leisure Group, which is a vacation company. Zomato has entered 24 countries, mind, mind you. And they've already acquired 12 startups, including Spars, Urban Sport. They may not be considered uh, you know, very profitable as of now still, as per the market reports. 
but at least they have expanded, taken the vision further. That's basically how do you take a foundation to an expansion based on. Of course, a startup timing is very important. So sometimes what happens, you might have the right right force. And certain socio-economic development, socio-political employment may delay your plans. How do you pivot out of that is completely up to you. How you take the essence of that crisis and look around. It might be that you have a mentor with you or a VC might be there to guide you or there will be some connections that you can use up. But that's, again, how you salvage the situation. That's where it comes to call of that. But beyond that, at least you have taken the call, you have taken the play, which is important. You know? <clears throat> then it's good for you because even if there's a crisis, a social political change, you're still safe because you are the foremost mover on that idea. The next comes to which are early adopters. So there still you have got a market which is hitting onto your pie, but it's not so unsafe. And then of course, next 34 by the adopters or the early majority who come in when they have seen that people are comfortably setting around a product or service. They are, and then the laggards were the safe, safest to play. They will come. But if you're in the sec laggard section or early majority, then you really need to do a hard work on pivot. But if you're the early adopters or you know uh, innovators, you're still safe to take a the call of the crisis or challenges that have come because of social political changes and move around. Continual improvement I've already touched upon, uh, but I would say the one concept which is catching on and many startups are of, uh, imbibing it is uh, design thinking. This is a concept which came in from Stanford. Uh, it's all about how you reapproach a particular problem or a product or an issue or any tenant from a very bottom-up approach. You break uh, explore the entire problem into small, small segments and then start focusing on small, small segments. It is considered very effective. Okay. I was doing a program in an organization in my past. I was employee there and uh, we touched this pro uh, design thinking. Uh, we optimized the company because that is essential. Besides your start innovation, how do you optimize your finances? And within four years, we optimized the revenue of around USD 20, $92 million. And that particular project, I have I had given my you know, authorization for that. It became a case study at IIM Ahmedabad in 2018-20. So uh, th these are the concepts uh, around how you take it around. And the last bit is how do you save the, you know, you have you acquired certain funds. Don't go into exuberance. You have seen a lot of cases which said with the moment an organization you know, gets a funding, they go all out into, you know, various, uh, doling out in the various ways to employees. It's a different thing when you want to keep employees happy engaged because that is a workforce which will deliver your product and offer it to the market. But same time, just keep rechecking on your doing it. Focus on your finances, do an effective fund management, be very smart in your employee engagement versus, you know, uh, the perks, the emoluments, your costings and all that. The moment, the more you save on your funds, the more you can do a pivoting. Okay, slow flow, be comfortable, then you can enlarge your scope. But before that, be very cautious because some some startup founders are so young. I've seen that happen. The moment they got their first funding, they went all about, you know, uh, trying to make the employees happy, creating a brand image and all that. And within eight months, they burnt all their funds. So now the VCs were not very happy. They would not get a second cashier of the funds. They were stalled. You know, so this is one thing that we have to keep in mind when funds flow or we are bootstrapped. That how do we balance our checks? How do we strategize how to spend this? Uh, what is the product we are bringing to the market? You know, that's a quick recap. Uh, what is my brand promotion? Uh, play around basically, again, all based on my funds or availability or how smart I can do a fund. You know. So all that is there. And yeah, that's more like it. I'm sorry I've spent out just six minutes left, but I'll appreciate if you've got any questions or suggestions. And of course, uh, if she told her she will help me run a poll, you know, if we were effective in at least giving you some kind of insights or, you know, things could be more meaningful to you. So continual improvement I've already touched upon as part of, you know, customer acquisition strategy, the surveys. Cash flow, I've already, as I've told you about, uh, so, sorry, Mesh, I was just, you know, going into more of auditorial mode. Putting it together, as I was saying, equity erosion, safe what you have earned, you know, don't go overboard. Plus. Yeah. And of course, yeah, this is one important, sorry, Sumesh, thank you for touching this upon. And I just one thing that, you know, uh, when you're talking about patents, products, your intellectual property, please ensure that, you know, you have kept them safeguarded. Uh, it is not the era when you can just bring out a product or a trademark, you know, a logo or a symbol, and you can just work upon it and nothing would happen. 
currently there is a lot of competition and conflict around trademarks you would not believe the number of litigations that are happening there are people who use a word play and steal the share of your product even 4% they take away you lose a lot of debt okay like sardar bakhsh case was there uh, burger singh versus burger king you know so many examples are there even for patents uh, you have got a particular patent you do have to do a priority art search it takes approximately a year for a patent to get registered you know even the code with all the processes and all that by that time somebody else will be coming with an idea so uh, the moment you are clear what you are trying to bring to the table if it's a service or a product already designed you just need to trademark it so that you protecting your copyrights uh, your ipr on that engage a legal team at the very onset once you're clear what you're bringing to the table safeguard your ip assets that's very essential otherwise it has happened that organization has spent 10 years or maybe 5 years into a product a lot of money has gone and poof within 7 months they are onto a court you know trying to safeguard their ip because somebody else has been smart enough to you know, uh, word play around on that trademark or taking your you know stealing your equity so that was uh, one element which i was missing out to thank you so much for bringing this to that and that's all guys that's all for me so open to you for anything in a well red ocean is of course as is so rightly pointed out rohan that you know in existing existing market with so many competition and uh, we have seen a crowded shelf in so many arenas now especially in a country where too much population is there everybody tries to you know take a share of there <clears throat> now with that too if you see uh, it is a very classic example while blue ocean offers you a lot of things so you can create a blue ocean in two ways either you redefine the complete product offering okay otherwise you would be just trying to take a pie of uh, as a legacy to what others have been or you come out with a completely new product which will be very intensive in terms of going around a complete new investment and funding and all that what zepto done as i was touching upon in my course also if you see what zepto did was one they came out with a 10 minute delivery well blinkit is known for it but zepto also came out with that same time they increased their delivery timeline if you see others may not did offer you delivered beyond 10 or 11 pm including instamart and zepto says that we are open till 11 1 am in the morning we are there for your dreams from morning to midnight okay so because there is a certain segment will need to come home late from office basically so they need to bring out something which they have not touched upon the day so they identified this gap because they themselves are youngsters who are behind that and so that's how they did what they did was we did the same product market line they tried to redefine the proposition and created a blue ocean uh I, I, I was able to give you some clarity over there. It's how Absolutely. you touch upon your products, right? Right, and then you create a blue ocean out of what is already there. Does that also mean so? Let's say I am creating a software for workforce planning, uh, right? So companies can use this software. Now there are already like fifty softwares glo- available globally, True. right? And I, if I come up with a you know innovative solution with a blue ocean strategy. does that mean i'm trying to like you know substitute all those other 50 companies you know how how should i think about it while pitching to other investors that how do i stand in this competitive space okay great question and uh, yes so you can say so because see red ocean and blue ocean basically just terms to help us you know categorize uh, the ecosystem and studies basically but uh, any time you touch upon something and try to redefine it you know that's completely blue ocean basically redefines how businesses look at your offers okay so if you are doing that i'll give you an example from here where you coming from apps experiences myself you've heard about zoho right and there's a lot of other companies also who are into workforce erp and others they face a challenge because either they bring a product which is very robust but they have not touched upon integrating it right and any company which is already running an sap or an erp module there's so many of flavors of there also would not like to go you know with the separate complete product which is because they have to cut down their erp because of that standard product anybody who brings a workforce module which is very easily integrating it to erp would be more than happy to look at it in a poc scenario and if somebody says is it a red ocean product no no more because now it has thought beyond it has approached beyond it has taken a risk to tap a market with a new uh, enhanced version of it and it has created a blue ocean of its own now others may try to come after it and try to enhance you know their same offering with the same additional feature so what you're doing right now with your workforce tool or app if you're trying to integrate it with certain more uh, 
third party apps in a way which makes the life easier for your customers you have already created a blue ocean and it's sorry Ron, just to add in here not more not just the price uh, not just the feature even the price point there are a lot of erp tools which are very expensive at uh, 17 features uh, touch points customer per license fee is very high so companies once they start expanding beyond 25 30 employees they stop looking at those products i have seen cases where certain products will let go very strong product because the pricing was touching very high at the moment scale goes high for a startup okay then they moved on to product which are light on uh, feature which rich at the same time price point high and these players despite knowing that market parity deliberately kept their price point low to keep a market competitive so this is an erosion but the moment they bring an extra feature along with that competitive price point that's a blue ocean so just wanted to add there got it so i think you touched upon that there are four possible uh, ways to look at it either you can create a new feature eliminate some existing features or uh, raise uh, you know raise or reduce matlab ye four words mere ko pata so uh, blue ocean comes when you eliminate something or create something and red ocean comes when you are like just uh, raising or reducing exactly if you're just in the same space trying for the same kind of customer base with the same kind of product i just see how you can do better with a more better branding more of customer uh, you know uh, conviction strategy and all that that's the red ocean the moment you better kar lete ho uske andar kuch actual tangible asset le aate ho apne product ke andar you know which more a redefined way that's the blue ocean beautiful thank you so much most welcome all the best for your venture I think there was one more question which asked if it's okay to launch a basic version of a product that is an MVP or does it need to be a fully developed product? Yes, Naeem, that's a very good question. You know, a lot of, uh, as I touched upon in the discussion today, a lot of companies have you know, quanting whether they want to do once the entire product is ready or can they do it at the initial POC stage also. Yes, it is able to, it's okay to launch a basic version of the product, okay, uh, but it depends on category to category. If you have got a product uh, which has, uh, you know, very innovative, you will see there's no market competition right now. Okay. That's where the smart move, uh, moves comes in. You can launch it because you will be able to develop it further. You will be working upon it. You know, it's, of course, you're not going to sit with the laurels of that innovation. You will keep on building upon it. Okay. But if you're entering a competitive market or if you're entering a market which is into an early adopter stage, that means a couple of competitors are already there. They will pick on your product and they will build upon it. So by the time you launch your full scale product, others may have a faster accelerated mode to bring it out. They may have got stronger funding, larger workforce to help that deliver and all that. So it's all completely up to us to decide based on our own product conviction and staging. So one, uh, coming to your question again, there is no deterrent for you to launch a basic version of product. Nobody's stopping you. Just look at what you're bringing to the table. It can be a service. If your design, service design is very robust, very good. It's a, a basic version, but ready to go. And you can still bring in some kind of, you know, it's a bootstrap company. You need to bring some kind of revenue initially. Go ahead with that. Okay. Just keep a lookout on what is your competition like. So that you do not, you know, uh, bypass you. I hope that answers.